FSB Merseyside and Cheshire event. Uh, I'm delighted to say uh, that we are welcoming back today our Wirral based member, Stuart Maddock. Uh, Stuart's the director of Clemorton Training and Development. And he's back uh, for the second in our series of events with him, looking at how we lead more effectively coming out of lockdown and into the recovery period. In our previous session with Stu, excuse me, my notes. In our previous session with Stu, uh, which was called Sales as the DNA of Your Business, it was fantastically well received. Um, we learned a lot, um, learned how to better utilize the power of referrals, leverage existing customer relationships, and understanding their short term priorities and needs, adapting service offerings accordingly, and also how to instill a sense of urgency around your offer as well as developing your team's skills around selling and generating revenue opportunities. This time, in lighting the motivation inside your people and customers, Stu is going to look at the question of motivation and how to motivate, which I'm sure you'll agree is so important to the success of your business. So he's gonna look at different personal factors behind how people are motivated and how to get the best out of your team and yourself in these challenging times also considering what motivates customers to make changes in their buying and purchasing powers, uh, purchasing behaviours. So without further ado, to the man himself, uh, Stuart has a wealth of experience as a trainer, mentor and coach, special areas of interest covering all aspects of leadership and management, sales, negotiation, business growth and business model prototyping. His career spans various senior leadership roles, coaching and mentoring people of all ages and experience levels and skill sets, including CEOs and company founders. More recently, he's been involved in the university sector, developing faculty management and administrative staff and thousands of students. So delighted to have him here again for the second uh, in our events with him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stuart Maddox, Clamorton at Training and Development. Thank you very much, Phil, for that fantastic introduction. So good morning, everybody. So nice to see so many faces this morning. Um, I've been set the challenge by Phil and the FSB to make sure that your time is well spent. Um, my intention very much for, for the next hour, hour and a half, is to try and give you as much uh, value and as, as much use out of your time as I can with me. Um, I'm conscious I can't see everybody because some people haven't got their cameras on, and also there's too many on my screen. Um, I'm, go I'm good morning, Norma. I'm going to uh, I'm going to try and do my best to get some interaction from you as well. Can I just get a bit of a show of hands? Who who out of the group here was um, on the last session um, that we ran? I know you were Phil. Absolutely. Who who else? Teresa, you were on the last one as well, were you? No, no, unfortunately not. Anybody else? No, so lots of new participants. Right, so let me just begin by saying, of course, Phil's talk about the fact that this is part of a coherent program. So in relation to a little bit about me, Phil's given me a nice introduction. A lot of you have not met me before. Um, instead of me talking too much about myself, here, here's some of the stuff that I do, just so you can have a, a brief look. Um, I'm not just a chap who's walking off the street that, that has got the opportunity to talk. Um, with you today. I, I'm really passionate about helping business owners. I'm really passionate about helping senior leaders. I've been doing it for 20 years. It's allowed me, if you look at the numbers, to meet lots of people. Um, the kind of most, the biggest impression that I've taken away from that is it's really affected my ability to help. It's really raised my game in terms of understanding the issues that business owners and senior leaders face. So what I'm going to try to do today very much is to make this really practical. So the title of the session, of course, is, is interwoven with motivation. But if I just for a brief moment look back at what we did last time, um, I'm going to try and seamlessly interlink some of the sales stuff that I talked about with the motivational aspects that we'll cover today. So in terms of I'm not sure of what type of roles, um, you know, the group have. You might be the founder, you might be the owner of the business, you might be somebody senior within that organization. So I've tried to make sure that this is useful for you on a number of levels. Firstly, for you as an individual, in terms of what you're doing now and what you want to do in the future. Also for you potentially as the business leader, 
or a sales leader of sorts in terms of having responsibility for other people's development. And of course, somebody that sets the tone for the culture within the people that you affect, be them any internal staff that you may have, or be those customers that you interact with. So again, can I just get a show of hands? Who actually has team members that they work with? I know a lot of, a lot of people out there are kind of individuals that work on their own, but there's also that mix there with people who have other people in the organization that they need to affect, both in terms of culture, in terms of skills, in terms of mindset. So I'm gonna try and cover quite a number of those things off when I speak to you about some of the, the key things um, that I'm gonna to cover today. Just a brief look back, I know the majority of the, um, the audience today wasn't on that session. And you, you may note from this particular image, and I hope there's no IP lawyers out there that are gonna kind of stick me with this one. Um, that's from Sky Sports, right? You, you, you may recognize that if you ever watch it. And, and, and for those that were on the program, I just wanted to do a little bit of questioning around transfer from last time. So some of the things for those of you that weren't on, I thought I'd share a couple of slides to give you context about where the program started to where we're going to head into today and then move forward on. So one of the things that we talked about and it interlinks into what we're going to talk about today is the speed and the timing of when organizations and individuals start to sell to their potential customers. We talked about this, this very real issue about often whether it's business owners or salespeople, and both of those are often interlinked, aren't they? You know, if we own the business, we have to go out, we have to sell the concept, we have to sell the idea. Um, often what happens is people start to sell a little bit too early in the process. And by that, what I mean is people will often start to talk a lot about product service, product market fit, what they've got, what they have, what they do, before they've managed to effectively generate and garner some energy in their potential customers around changing what they do at the moment. So if we take a step back and we think about that, if we can generate interest in the customer to understand that there might well be a need for change, we've now done our primary job, our primary job being to make them consider whether they should or should not do something differently. Does that make sense? You know, if we think about that as being reasonably good common sense from a commercial point of view, what I often see going in as an external into organizations is that unless we can do that first of all, unless we can actually generate that impetus with the other person or organization to say, hey, let's really look at what we're doing here, whether it's current supplier, or whether it's actually uh, a happiness with the status quo. Does anybody find that? That's, sometimes people are just happy to do what they do, even if that's nothing. <laughs> you know, I haven't got what your service or product does, and, I, and I'm actually fine with it. I haven't got a problem with not having somebody that does what you do. I'm okay. You know, we almost can feel like we become a bit of a disrup disruption. Not all the time, but sometimes, right? So. Part of what we talked about in, in, in session one was about understanding how to strip back, that back and generate that, that interest around changing. And subsequently, and I think Phil will notice this, what I, what I described was something that I've tried to put visually, is that when we go to a customer, particularly if they're new, right? Not if they're existing and they're already doing business with us, but particularly if they're new, the competitive landscape that they see is usually fulfilled by current suppliers or their status quo of nothing. That, that makes reasonable sense, right? Um, so to try and put this visually, already whatever your plugin is or your solution, they've got one, haven't they? Whether that is, whether that is somebody that's directly competing with you or whether it's the, the idea that they have, that they don't require what you have, so they're comfortable with not having a solution. So there's already a plug in the wall, so to speak. Yeah. So the first job that we have, and this will link into the motivational stuff that we'll look at, the first job that we have is generating that impetus to at least question in the mind of the customer or client, should I consider taking that plug out or making room for a new plug? And if we consider our business to be that, the opportunity that we want to plug into somebody's life, 
into somebody's organization to make their lives better, then of course the challenge we have to, to get over, the initial hurdle, is getting them to consider unplugging. So developing that need for change and getting them to figuratively pull the plug out first before they look at a new solution is kind of where we need to go initially. Yeah, so when we think about motivation today, one of the motivations I want you to think about from a customer point of view, not an internal point of view, is how do you generate the need for change within your customers by tapping into what motivates them about either themselves or their business? And I'm guessing that this isn't the first time that you've thought about that. But if I'm putting that under the microscope today and challenging you as senior people or business owners to go back and give this more thought, because that's all I can hope to be today is some sort of catalyst for what you might develop as an action plan after today, right? So if I can get you to think about effectively how you do that more, uh, more practically by the words that you use or the questions that you ask and the way that you understand the motivations of your new clients and your current clients, if you can garner and build more energy around change, then you're more likely to get more opportunity to sell. Make sense? I know that's not rocket science, right? I understand that's not rocket science. But actually applying it and doing that effectively takes a bit of time on a granular level to say, okay, so what is my messaging like at the moment? If somebody was observing me genuinely, do me and my people in my organization sometimes sell a little bit too quickly? Do we go and try and plug into a socket that's already full with another plug? Because if you sell too quickly, of course, it often falls on deaf ears, doesn't it? You know, I've got something, I'm okay. I don't need it. And that links into the psychological cascade that we looked at originally in session one, right? And that, and for those of you that weren't there, and even for those that were, it, it's very, very worthwhile reiterating what, what this psychological cascade is. What this relates to is the psychologists have got hold of um, a reasonably replicable, mo replicable model for what cascade we go through in our mind when we're deciding whether we should change or not. So all of us, without really thinking it through, have this cascade that we apply to situations in our own lives that, that questions whether we should do something differently or not. And the way that they've managed to do this through really good observational research is they've helped us understand what that process looks like. So for example, take yourself. Take yourself around anything that you are considering making a change about at the moment. Let's make it professional, let's make it in the business. So it could be Jeff, it could be Terry, it could be Teresa, it could be James, it could be Alison, it could be anybody else who sat there. There's something in your business at the moment that you are considering making a change about, undoubtedly, if not more than one and multiple things. You became aware of that thing somehow, whether it was feedback, it was something was broken, you dropped the ball, an opportunity came along that you want to take advantage of in a different way. Something is now in your mind. And for many of us, we sit and we think about it a lot, don't we? Now, the psychologists grab hold of that and they look at people in those situations and they say, what do they then do next? Well, what they do and what we do is often we say, well, if I don't make a change about that particular thing, if I ignore it, what will happen? Will that be good? Will it be bad? Make sense? So we just, we just immediately jump into this questioning phase where we analyze and we say, well, is it good or is it bad for me if I do nothing? And this now relates to motivation, doesn't it? Because actually the motivation to do something differently is fundamental to getting you an opportunity with other people but it's also fundamental to you going and taking an action around doing something differently in your business. So if we follow that through, we then do some evaluation, don't we? And we say to ourselves, well, what is my conclusion to that question that I asked myself? Is it good for me? Is it bad for me? Now think about the, the options. If we, if we answer, so Anne, you're, you're front and center on, on, on my screen. Um, if you were, for example, to answer that it was good for me if I didn't make a change. You know, if you think about the consequences of that, usually you just carry on. You know, I've articulated it here. You go about your merry way. 
Um, I think deeper than that, and, and it's borne out by the research, is deeper than that, we actually actively resist any change, don't we? Because if we think it's not going to have a problem or create us an issue, why would we change from the status quo? We, we, we wouldn't, because it's easier for us to do nothing, isn't it? And I'm not saying we're innately lazy, I don't think we are, but I think, I think path of least resistance often is, is what happens, because we've got a lot on our plate. So if we don't feel we need to change that something, it's unlikely that we'll bother because we can put our energy into something else. Let's flip the coin. So Terry, you're sat there, I can see. Yeah, if you, if you answer, it's not good for me, and you decide by your analysis that it's bad, either I'm not taking advantage of something I could, or I'm not mitigating my risk against something that could be, you know, disadvantageous in the future. Now you've got that impetus, haven't you? You know, you actually say to yourself, well, I'm not sure what I need to do yet, but I know I do need to do something. And that's the getting over the hurdle psychologically of, of motivation being a feeling and being converted into an action, isn't it? I'm now going to do something about it. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm going to do something. So what we do next in the, in the filtering process is we then create possibles, we give ourselves options. If we're, if we're particularly creative, we come up with a number of things. If we're not, we need to think about how we access if we've got people on the team or our customers to help us kind of get them to that ideation stage around what we could do. But ultimately we then, we place all of these options in front of us mentally, don't we? What do we do next? Totally cool with you jumping in as well, by the way, please do feel free to unmute. What, um, what do we do next? We've got all these possibles. What do we do now? What, what do you do? Norma? Anyone, anyone want to offer a suggestion to Stu? Norma's yeah. throwing a hand up. Do we want to try to change attitudes? Yeah, we could do. We might want to change attitudes. Um, we're thinking about doing something differently now. So we've got these options. So where do you go to if you want to change attitudes about your options? What, what do you usually go to next? And you've unmuted as well, I think. Have you? Um, yeah, I, I was going to say I would evaluate each of the possibilities to see if they were good or bad for me. Yeah, so you then do that analysis, don't you? And part of that normal will be about what, what will people think about this? You know, that will go into the mix, won't it? We evaluate, we analyse, and we say, well, which one or number of these would be the best course of action? But just out of interest here, hands up if you do that really quickly. Who, who, who's like got a quick mind that analyzes real fast and decides pretty sharply on a course of action? Right? And it, it's no surprise within a group like this of self-starters, motivated individuals that are going and doing something for themselves that you will quickly sift through because you've got, you've got a degree of understanding and expertise in what you do, which is why you do it. You understand the landscape that you operate in and you make choices. Now, when it only affects you, and this is the point about motivation, when it only affects you, it's okay to then surge forward with relentless optimism and energy, isn't it? Here we go. This is going to be great. I'm going to try it. Jeff's going to grab the bull by the horns and do what he wants to do, and he's going to move forward. Yeah. Now, that's okay within the business. It's part of what our responsibilities are. However, now when we consider customers or internal team members, we have to think about how we take a step back from that potentially, don't we? Because what's the risk? Norma mentioned about attitudes a moment ago. What's the risk if we select and execute? What's the risk if we just- Get it wrong. We, got, we might get it wrong. So Barry, we, we, we may have made um, an incorrect choice about the options, or we may not have considered the impact of the options well enough, yeah. or we may disenfranchise people just by the very act of making and taking this decision without the collaboration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now if you think about extrapolating that onto customer or client situations, what you now garner or generate is barriers and objections because you are making and taking decisions on their behalf, even if you're their trusted advisor. Now, now, genuinely now, therefore what I need to get you to think about is what does that mean in your process of understanding and developing your relationship with your team members and with your clients? So if it's a new client, who puts most of the effort in to the first sale? 
who puts a load of effort into getting that first, getting across the line, right? You're winning the contract, satisfying them, making them happy with what you've got, selling the benefits, talking about features, talking about benefits, talking about long-term, talking about pain and gain, all the things that salespeople think about, right? Some of them we recoil from, don't we? And we're like, oh, I don't really want to see myself as being that type of person. But I think the reality is we really, really do need to uncover needs. We really do need to uncover impacts. We talked a lot about that on session one. Now what I want to do is I want to take a pivot and I want to enter the space of motivation specifically. So I'm going to change my focus, right? We've been talking about commercial relationships. I've been peering down this barrel at you all saying, let's garner a, a, a need for change. Yeah. Now, what I want you to think about the need for change in relation to is how you balance that off against customer or employee motivation. Because if we think about selling, we're not, you know, we're, we're selling our ideas all the time, right? You know this, aren't we? We're selling our vision, we're selling our mission, we're selling our decisions, we're selling our, we're selling our choices that we've made when we go through that cascade, both internally and externally. If it affects product or service, it's going to affect your customers. If it affects working practice or potential lifestyle of employees, it can be hugely impactful. Now, remember, uh, um, employees is also you. Yeah, it's also you because you are fundamental, particularly if you're on your own. You, you know, it doesn't operate without you. But even if you're a small team or a large team, you're a fundamental part of that. So I think the easiest way for us to look through this lens is to say, for the next 20 minutes, just think about yourself. Let's be selfish. We got onto this call today for our own reasons, didn't we? Whatever that reason was, right? You've signed up. Hopefully it's with a positive air of expectation that this might be useful. But, you know, if I fail, that's my fault, right? But um, does anybody mind sharing why they've, they've blocked this out in their diary? We know, why have you come on today? Does anybody mind sharing what their own personal motivation for doing this today is? Yes, James. Yeah, so so for me, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so so for me, yeah. it was getting getting that refresher of how to mo motivate other people. Um, we're a small business, there's only two of us. I've previously yeah. managed and run large teams, and I've kind of forgotten some of the skills uh, in, in motivating uh, team members. Yeah. So yeah, that was me. Okay, great. So so if you think about that, therefore. For me, I'm going to ask you in a moment, but for me, what motivation is personally is it sits at the intersection of feeling and doing for me. So I can get excited about stuff. I can get excited about many things, right? But unless I have motivation as the fuel to push that excitement from a thought into an action, then it was kind of a bit of a waste of time. And I've wasted a lot of my time over the years, as anybody else, think, you know, hypothesizing, thinking things through. But is it really a waste of time? Probably not, because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to ascertain and isolate what I actually should spend my energy and time doing. So we come back to that analysis phase. I think it's important. But at some point, unless motivation pushes me from the brink of thought into action, actually, it doesn't serve me well. So it's the point at which it be, almost becomes a verb and it makes me do something is when it really benefits me, yeah? So you, James, have had enough motivation to push you to go and log in today and say, I'm going to put aside 90 minutes of my time and I'm going to try and get something from it. And it comes against a backdrop or a context of wanting to refresh, yeah? Um, what, what other reasons out there who else wouldn't mind sharing why they've, you know, why they found themselves on the, on the screen today? Anybody else? P uh, Peter, have you got your hand up? Uh, can you hear me, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can't oh, yeah. see you, I can hear you. Yeah, we've got kids running about, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so for me, it was literally, we started a business a year ago and I've come to this stark reality that just because I'm motivated or driven in a certain way, doesn't, doesn't mean that everybody else is, uh, which was quite an eye-opener for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of smiles on the group at that point, wasn't there? You know, we can find that, can't we? It's hard to get, it's hard to match the enthusiasm and drive <laughs> that we might be experiencing ourselves. It's, it's also really difficult, isn't it, when we would hope or expect even 
a certain high percentage of that drive to exist in others around maybe our vision or our mission and, and our product or our stuff. You know, it's, it, how do we then, how do we, you know, we've I, I often call this, and you'll have heard this analogy a lot, it's not about lighting a fire underneath somebody, it's about lighting a fire inside, right? We know it. We, we hear it all, all the time. There's loads of different ways of saying it. How do you get that intrinsic buildup of passion and energy around even just task accomplishment, right? Which And those tasks could be pretty banal and pretty dull, but we need them doing. You know, we have to do stuff we don't enjoy, right? Who, who spends some of the day doing stuff that is, is not what they'd like to be doing? Yeah, there's some stuff. It's, it's, on our, it's in our inbox. It's on our table. It needs to be done, and I just have to get on with it, right? And so do other people. Um, but how do we get them there? How do we get them aligned with our excitement about what the outcome might be? Yeah? Okay, anybody else want to throw into the mix? Anybody else? Yeah, Alison? I want to do things differently. So going into the new year, I want things to change. Um, yeah. So I thought it was a good time to do the workshop. Okay, great. So yours, your reason is finding the catalyst for change and understanding what it is that you want to do differently, yeah. which is a great motivator, right? Because it makes you think about the possibilities. So again, we go back to the past day. It makes you think about the possibilities. And hopefully today you'll be writing down a few of those possibilities and deciding which one you might push forward on. Yeah. So I'll do my best to give you some options from a different angle. Good. Okay, thanks, Alison. Anne, did you throw your hand up? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, mine is about motivating my clients. Um, okay. I, I am a property manager and I offer a different solution to help um, landlords save money on professional fees. Yeah. And I, I can see that a lot of them, they come to me and they want the information, but they don't mm -hmm. take the final step. So it's just about yes. um, I'm getting them, them motivated to keep going okay. and making sure that I'm putting the message across properly. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's try and tip the scales a little bit more through preparation in understanding how you can set that up a little bit better. So mm. what I said before, what I'd really like you all to do is be a bit selfish and think of yourself in relation to this at the start now, right, in terms of the motivation aspect. Here's a question, and I just want to throw it out to the group. What is motivation to you? And I don't mean, you know, not, not what gets you out of bed. In the, I, I, the question is not what motivates you. The question is what, what is it? You know, fundamentally different questions, right? But if I just put that 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 first um, question up on its own, sometimes people will say, "Well, this motivates me and that motivates me." I don't mean that. I mean, you know, what is it for you? And I, it, it might be different for for each of us. I just want to hear some versions. We can Google it, can't we? And we can find out a, probably a thousand definitions in in ten seconds, right? But what what's it mean to you? Anne, have you unmuted again? Yeah, I was just going to say for me, it's a, a desire to achieve something. Yeah. So it's a desire to actually get something done. Terry, you? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's um, recognition of a need and an urge to fulfil it. Yeah. So recognition and then an urge, urgent desire. Yeah. So some golden threads in the, just in those first two answers there, I think. Um, we articulate it in different ways, don't we? But, but how do you articulate it for yourself? What, what else? We, we, we've got some in the chat, Stu. So uh, Barry Honeyman says... Okay, uh, I just motivation. can't see it because the way my screen's set up. No worries. Well, motivation is the drive to continue in the face of all adversities. Which I think is interesting. Okay. So that's motivation, interesting. this is so that, from Teresa that, Jones. Motivation is about maintaining forward movement. Yeah. So some momentum, a momentum that might crash through a barrier. If I go back to the other one that you said out loud, Phil, uh, pushing through in the face of adversity. So it, it's about maintaining energy, movement, desire, drive. It, a lot of these things are like action style words, aren't they? It's like it is do. It's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of do in there, isn't there? Yeah. There's, I guess there's the state of mind question, which is how while you're motivated as well that's different but often you know if, if we shut our eyes and think about a time that we're motivated i would imagine that these feelings of effervescence and energy come to us don't they because usually to push against adversity or to 
to achieve or to drive or to surge forward ultimately we need to do something about it we need to get up for that don't we would prime ourselves and we go and do it um you know there are physiological responses that we know exist when it happens but i think the reality for business owners is it's it, it's down to action isn't it how do i take action today on the things that i know i need to get done mitigating risk or taking advantage of opportunities so a big common thread there um I'm going to give you perhaps a new way or not. I don't know whether you've looked at this before. I might give you an interesting angle on it if you have, right? And I hope so. Has anybody ever heard of equity theory? <coughs> Has anybody heard of this? No. Okay. So bear with me for a moment. Then let me just describe briefly what it is, right? If it's the first time we've come into contact with it, it makes, it makes me think that the appropriate thing to do is to do a reasonable description of what it involves, right? So if we, if we assume that the premise of uniqueness to some degree is true in terms of our own motivational profiles, right? It's particularly important. Now, I had a conversation and part of what I do, and Phil knows this, some of you may may not know i did put a slide up on some of the things that i do but i i spend time one-to-one -one with founders business owners and senior leaders and we pick apart strategy and we talk about the challenge that they've got for growth particularly a lot of the time you know ambitious people often want to grow and they want to grow in different ways and the complexity of motivation is often one of the problems that underpins that you know understanding more about ourselves initially which is why i've asked you to be selfish here and our people and our customers and everybody else we interact with is fundamental to getting closer to being aligned to doing a better job with motivating people so james if i go back to you with the refresher aspect looking at this through a new lens potentially could be really helpful so there's a chap and this was a long time ago here's the guy right that's him and developed this theory his name was John Stacy Adams. He was a workplace and behavioral psychologist. He penned the theory that actually, <laughs> when I tell you what it is, it's one of those theories that I love. It's as if it, it always existed in your mind. Yeah, it did, but he's given it a name. And he, he very cleverly penned it in a way that allows us to really connect with this, right? It's very, very important. The reason why I mentioned what the type of work I do with owners and founders is I was uh, I got to sit in on a board meeting yesterday in London of the tech company that are doing really well, might get bought out in a couple of years. They're, they're, they're really flying, but they still got loads of challenges, right? And, and their challenge is fundamentally around motivating the SLT, their senior leadership team, to deliver against what the investors need. And so we started to talk about the psychology of the individuals that I know because I've coached the senior leadership team for a while. So I know them and we talked about who they are and what gets them excited. So we we're talking about this as part of this discussion. And part of what I used to give them a way of viewing it was actually this theory. So John Stacy Adams developed a simple equation that I think all of us on screen now could immediately relate to, right? That equity theory looks like this. We're all stood around, we're all doing our stuff, right? In the workplace, we never really articulate this to each other, but we wonder whether we have kind of got our relationship right with either our employer or the business that we run. So who has employees that they pay? Who actually has full-time employees or part-time employees that they pay? So a few of you, yeah? Um, not all of us, but some of us. Do we pay ourselves? <laughs> Hopefully. Maybe not yet. I don't know what stage you're at and I don't know what you're doing, right? But, and it's not all about pay. If you think about what I've just said, if we pay ourselves, it's the most, it's the simplest thing to hang your hat on about what you get back from a company, isn't it? Or a business or an organization. It's often the easiest thing to translate into a return. You know, what do I get paid? What, what's my worth? I'm not saying that's a, a direct correlation, right? But it's an easy thing to put our finger on and say, okay, that's one of the things that I get back or expect. Yeah. I would like to do it for nothing, but I can't afford to do it for nothing. Yeah. So the equation that he penned was this I and O. And in the middle, he had this fancy mathematical sign. That the, 
Do we all know what that fancy sign means? Can I just ask for somebody's answer rather than me assuming? What does that kind of fancy mathematical term in the middle mean? Anybody want to stick their neck on the line or do you want me to just shout? Approximately equal to? Approximately equal to or roughly equal to, right? So what we're expecting, think about the name of the theory, it's equity theory. Now we've got it, obviously I, I, I need to then fill the gaps, right? I need to say what I is and I need to say what O is. So John Stacey Adams said, we have this hardwired into our brains that we want our inputs to roughly equal or balance out through our outcomes. Now, if we think about what that means, yeah, in a workplace or professional scenario, let's start there, right? Because it's what we're, we've got our mind on our businesses, right? So if we start there and we say, right, okay, I've got inputs and I've got outcomes. What do they really mean? So can I just check, can you read the text? Is that, is that a, a reasonable size to be able to be read by you on the screen? Yeah, all good, okay. So have a little look at the inputs, right? This is what you bring to the job, the role, the company. This is what you do, isn't it? If you want, want to employ people, we have a mechanism for understanding what their inputs will be. We have a number of them, yeah? We have, uh, we have CVs, don't we? Or as my American wife would say, resumes. And we, we, we try and articulate through the power of the pen or typing what we are good at and what we can do and what we will bring to the party, don't we? We have an interview process. <coughs> an opportunity through which we, we have a, a courtship with a potential employee as an employer, and we decide whether they will be good for us or not, and they are also deciding whether we'll be good for them or not. So two sides to the coin or to the scale, right? All of us bring different stuff. So have you got a pen? Have you all got a pen and a piece of paper or somewhere to note something down? Brilliant. I saw your pen, Peter. It looks very nice. Um, can you now, for me, list three inputs for you personally that are key in relation to the value that you think you deliver to the business? So three strengths, three things that you bring to the party that for you are fundamental to who you are and what you bring. So what do you do for the business? Or if you were going to come and work in my business, what would you bring to my business or any other? Just list three things. Write them out. I'll give you a couple of, give you a minute or two to do that. I see your scribbling as well, Phil. Good. FSB, FSB will want some value from this session from you as well, I'm sure. I have to say as well, just a little bit of background noise for you while you're, um, you're filling this in. Uh, depending on which country or nationality of people that I'm speaking to, wherever I ever bring up this equity theory, I'll often get people to do this exercise. I have to say in the UK, I think we're one of the worst, the worst nations at actually being honest about what our strengths are. I'm not saying you, I just mean generally. We... A lot of people hate kind of blowing their own trumpet, don't they? Or tooting their own horn or whatever we want to call it. We're quite, um, quite humble often. Not everyone, but, um, you know, we, we will often struggle to say, well, actually, I am. I am good at this. Yeah. And um, this is what I think I will bring. Um, other nations, not so much. I'll let you decide who, who they are. So have you got, uh, you got a list of three there? And you might have written one word, you might have written a sentence for each, I don't know. Now, if you think about, you think about that, right, you think about this equation, we can even extrapolate this out into our private lives, can't we? Let's make it a bit of fun for a moment, instead of just being all dry and about the business. Let's think about our relationships generally, right? So if you think about what I and O represent, many of you will have gone to the kind of give and take principle in your head, yeah? Yeah. Um, that give and take principle is the unspoken kind of contract that we have with our friends and our loved ones and our family, isn't it? I'll do this, you do that. Um, I'll be responsible for that. You'd be responsible for this. And my input's that. I hope to get this back. Now, 
think about that, right? In a professional environment, usually there are a certain set of expectations around what people will input and what they'll get back for that input. That's not quite as clear cut at home, is it? Yeah, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to put any of us on the psychologist's couch, but it, it genuinely is not as clear cut as that. We don't have role or job expectation documents at home. Um, Hopefully in organizations as you scale and you grow, for example, or you bring people in, there's a bit of clarity around what people should do and um, how they should go about that, right? What I would like you to think about now is on your piece of paper, let's stay professional, let's stay about work, list for me, right? Within your framework, your business or your organization, your needs and wants are really important, aren't they, in terms of motivation levels? The things that you expect or want back are really key. Your attitude towards things, so coming back to Norma's point, attitudes, your attitude and your emotional state of mind are fueled and driven by how you feel about your relationship with your employer or the business. Yeah? So grab that pen again for me. List three outcomes that for you are central to your satisfaction and motivation levels in the work that you do. So what are the things that you feel that you need back? Or want back? You might not be getting them at the moment, but you want them. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I'm just going to flip back to this a moment because if we were together in a room, which would be the ideal, right? We'd be spending some time together and we've been we kind of treat this just like a normal workshop where we were talking about stuff. At this point, we'd probably split into some groups and I would be saying, okay, talk to each other about, you know, your first list, your inputs, what you bring. The caveat here is I've already said that as a as a nation, we're not, not necessarily great at shouting out loud about all the things that we think we're good at. But does, does anybody is anybody comfortable enough to share one or two things that they really do bring that, that helps the business? Anybody want to unmute and just kind of tell us a couple of things on their input list? Experience. Experience. And be really specific with me about the experience that helps the business. Okay, over 14 years experience working in the property sector. Okay, so it's aligned to what it is that you're trying to achieve. So yes. it's wealth of knowledge and understanding of the market and the customers that allows you to do certain things possibly much quicker than if you didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Phil, you've unmuted as well, sir? I, I have, and I, I know I've, I've kind of done this from the perspective as if I was... I just started a business rather than like with the FSB. But my first one was expertise. And I think that's the same thing, isn't it? Exactly the same thing. Um, that's why, you know, what, what will motivate you to kind of go from employment to start business in the first place. And uh, the other two things, worth ethic, work ethic, and the time devoted to the business, because as a business owner, you know, no one's going to be able to match that. Uh, yeah. And kind of the other thing was, I was, I was left sketching what, what, what to put and I put analytical skills because, I think that's a strength. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so we can see there, can't we? When we start to think that out, we try <clears throat> we try and put down on paper what are the key things that we bring, that there will be many things, right? Your list, I've I've li I've limited you to three. I'm sure there's there's a list as long as your arm, right? Um, Peter, you've got your hand up too. You want to share? I actually went completely the opposite way. Everybody else is talking about experience and bringing wealth and knowledge and stuff. I literally, I think one of my strongest points is the ability to say that I don't know something. 
um, the okay. ability to walk away from a situation yeah. saying, actually, not a Scooby, but I'll look yeah. into it and I'll figure it out and then we'll come back at it. Yeah. So that element of self-awareness about be, being somebody that is hung, hungry or thirsty to learn and ask questions is actually healthy and therefore it benefits the business. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great. OK, thanks, Peter. Anybody else want to throw their hat into the ring? James, I'm going to pick on you, if I may, because you're, you, you were the one that wanted refreshing. So tell me what this has made you think about inputs. Yeah, sure. So, so in terms of uh, my inputs, I've got more than three, but there you go. Um, yeah, I'm English. Well, I am British, I should say, which is unusual. But um, so, yeah, uh, I bring uh, innovation and development, um, which is what we needed here to shake things up. Um, yeah. Sales experience. So 20 years of uh, managing and running departments in marketing, sales and circulation. Yeah. Um, knowledge other people have, have touched on what that might mean as well um yeah. and 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 the ability to achieve growth for the business yes okay good so part of part of this process of of analyzing and understanding on a granular level about how to motivate is understanding first of all yourself right i think that's a key part i'll i'll, I'll summarize this at the end i'll give you a couple of action points to think about right knowing yourself is really key knowing what you bring and knowing what you do the inputs and the value that you add is absolutely critical. Now, now turn out from you and turn to everybody else. <laughs> Getting an appreciation and an understanding very clearly of not only what you think about other people, but what they think about themselves is fundamentally critical to building and driving trust in your relationship as a business owner or a leader in any environment, right? So taking time to build that relationship and work on it constantly is going to aid your understanding of how people view themselves within the business. And if there's a gap between how they view themselves and how you view them, how we can start to close that gap by demonstrating and giving you evidence of what they believe about themselves. Or if they are an individual that isn't self-confident around certain areas that they're already competent in, you can build trust and confidence in them by giving them that feedback, which we know that feedback loop works really well. But from a motivational standpoint, really getting to understand your people, not you first, then your people. Now extrapolate it out again. We're going out in, in kind of ever increasing circles, aren't we? We now then come to the customer and the client. Coming to the customer and the client and understanding what they bring to the relationship and the value that they add by partnering with you and what they view about themselves or their organization is absolutely critical in allowing you to align what you do with what they do. Yeah. Which is hard to get at the start, but as you build your relationship, it becomes easier. I, I was at a talk, <laughs> I was at a talk only two weeks ago with a marketeer who speaks a lot across the country, very, very good. Um, talked about, drew a horizontal line, right? We're all in the room, he just drew a horizontal line. And about 20% of the way across that line from left to right, he drew a vertical line and said, this is the sale. Here's the sale, right? And then he said, actually forget the sale, here's the first date, you know, and related it to relationships, about partners, whatever it is. And he was like, how much effort do you put in before the line? And everyone's like, loads, loads. I want to get the business. I want to get the first date. I want the relationship to start off well. And then he said, really now, how much effort do you put in after the line? How much do you care enough after the line to want to create a relationship that stays and has longevity? I mean, who's, who's in a long-term partnership at the moment? This isn't a relationship session. I just, I just wonder who, who is in a long-term partnership of sorts? either business-wise or, or, or personally. Think of the effort that goes into maintaining that. You know, think of the levels of trust that are required in order for you to keep that momentum up so that you get more solid over time, not erode and crumble things. So if you think about putting that effort into the relationships that you have with your customers, I'm not saying you don't. This is not personal. I'm just getting us to think generically about that. How do we get to really understand what makes our customers tick? Cross-selling and upselling opportunities in your client and customer base exist primarily through conversations that are not related to what your current product or service does. They're related to all the conversations you have around it, and even the conversations that have got nothing to do with what you sell. 
that's what relationships are about, aren't they? You know, we don't talk about going on a date all the time with somebody we're in a long-term relationship with, but our, our relationship builds with them. The customers that we have strong relationships with are built on the things that are non-business related as well as business related. So interweaving all of that stuff builds your trust. The higher your trust gets, the more likely that you'll have a long-term relationship, the more likely that they'll come to you when required, which means that you won't get displaced, not as frequently as you would if you didn't. You know, and that marketeer articulated that really succinctly and look, a lot better than I can, right? But it made me think. It made me think about how much effort gets put in after the line. And that's not just you. If you've got other people, it's how much effort are they putting in after the line's been drawn. It's to think about what that means. Because if we now flip across and we say, okay, what do you want back? So who's willing to unmute and tell, tell me what they want back? What outcomes are you looking for? What do you want from your business, from, from the place to work? What are you looking for? What's on that list? Who wants to unmute and tell me a little about it? Peter, Peter, you've come with your hand up. What do you want back? Uh, I've got three things. So I put accountability. So from both sides, like client side and employee side, I always ask for accountability. Uh, yeah. honest, honest communication, again, from both. Just if you don't have that, it's just pointless. Uh, and commitment is the other thing as well. And um, most of yeah. our clients are on like 20, uh, 12 month contracts. Uh, we yeah. run a, a cleaning business. And um, so that's quite a big ask from a lot of people, but mm -hmm. that's what I felt kind of gives us what we, what we need to be able to, to build a good relationship. Yeah. So really good, right? You've thought that through, you're thinking about what you want back, what it is that you need in order to, to be satisfied and feel like you're doing a good job. Yeah. And don't forget, this is just a list of three. I'm sure there's a lot more things that you want. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some money would be all right at the end of the day. That'd be all right, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, some money would be fine. Um, lots of money would perhaps be great or not. It depends what your view is. Um, benefits would be great, all sorts of things, yeah? Um, yeah. Um, that list is could be really long for some people and could be quite short for others. Some people know laser-like focus on what I, need, what I want. You know, I just want this, this, and this, and I'm happy. Others are very complicated aren't they? I need this 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 and then I need that and then I need these things and then I want all of that stuff and then I'd love this and I want all of these things which is why managing and leading teams can be difficult because everybody's pretty different yeah what, what else is on those lists for you um thanks Peter we'll go next and yeah um top of my list would be satisfied clients and yeah. the reason that, that that's top of my list is because I think um, that leads them to longevity with that business relationship and also word of mouth referrals or a, a Google review. Yeah. I don't mind, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that can help build my, you know, one and promote my business as well, my credibility. Absolutely. And I, and I think you've just hit upon a real rich vein of, of, of many businesses, sources of new revenue is the referral aspect, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Having satisfied clients that are happy and actually become you know to use an american term raving fans of what you do <laughs> it's, it's like gold, you know it's like that's your currency isn't it yeah you know, more raving fans i can generate the the more likely it is that my business will have longevity and i might get some of those things that i really want including maybe some financials or maybe some benefits that that, that benefit me directly too yeah good thanks yeah. what else phil you were looking like you were going to say something is was that right or no yeah, yeah. I mean, the first two are probably what you'd expect traditionally from the perspective of a business owner. I want sales. I want a customer pipeline, referrals, um, repeat customers, new customers. I want ultimately profitability. I want, want to create income. But also, and I think this is really important, um, I want to enjoy what I do and, and enjoy the time I spend doing it. Yes. Um, that is, that's a big motivational factor. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that. And uh, that I'm sure there's a lot of nods around the room that that's really important, isn't it? You know, we've got to get up on any given day, but ideally we want to be getting up to do something that we kind of found a bit of fun, at least, or at least enjoyable and, and wholesome and fulfilling and, you know, uh, gives us the right sort of mission or vision. Like, you know, a lot of founders I work with, and it was articulated again earlier this morning, is how do you get how do you get people excited about vision and how do you get them as excited as you about trying to do the things that you want to achieve? Um, if you get people that jump out of bed and are happy to come in, uh, including ourselves, then that's half the battle. Attitudinally, normally we go back to that. 
it changes the way that people inter inter interact. You know, the attitude behavior is, is critical in business. My attitude affects my behavior, which affects your attitude, which affects your behavior. So it's, it's fundamentally the nucleus of how days go smooth or days go badly. Yeah. Okay, good. Terry, you've unmuted. Are you uh, going to pitch in? Uh, well, I was just um, going to talk more sort of selfishly, really. Um, go for it. And uh, I find that from clients and from my work, environment i enjoy recognition just to be acknowledged as the expert that i am yeah. in my yeah. field and also opportunity to grow and learn about other aspects of business and life and to experience them so those are the kind of things i look for and have for yeah. many years really yeah yeah it's a really and money as well and money and some money and some money terry some money's good too it kind of oils things, doesn't it, sometimes, if we get a bit of money back as well. Yeah, as Peter was saying. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think Terry hits on an important point there. It makes me really start to think then about the, the transition from ourselves out to others. You know, part of this, of course, and I've asked you to be selfish, Terry, so I'm glad you have been, right? Part of this is about saying, well, if this is fundamental to me, when I start to transpose this onto others, what are they looking for? What do they want back? What's important to them? You know, kind of uh, this, this moniker or label that, that often people like me or people that do things like I do, you know, leadership coach or executive coaching, fundamentally, one of the things that often I end up trying to get to the bottom of, Terry, is how senior leaders will effectively do that with other people. And the answer, I, I, I don't know whether you read any of the blurb about this session, right? So, the you know, what are we going to do? Fundamentally uncover that motivation, I said, is, is two things at once. It's complicated and it's simple. It's complex because the nature of each of us differs vastly. So that unique fingerprint that we have from a motivational perspective means that I, as a leader, for example, or a business owner or a salesperson, needs to be able to tap into what makes each person tick. I need to understand them. I can't understand them unless I'm willing to have them understand me because trust is a two-way street. And I, when I work with senior leaders, for example, or owners, right, of businesses that grow, sometimes the, the expectation is that it's one-way traffic. So Barry, tell me a little bit about what motivates you, you know, and they ask the question and they want to know. I mean, often they only ask in an interview, and then they don't ask it again. You know, if I work with corporates or big organizations, if I just say, when was the last time your manager or supervisor or team leader asked you genuinely what motivates you? It was like, not since interview or not even then, or maybe they mentioned it in passion two years ago. You know, so it's about creating an environment that also allows them to understand us, isn't it? Because if, if trust is two way, you know, I talked about this on session one about building client relationships. The psychology of trust is, is simple. The psychology of trust is that we give and we get. We, we expose things about ourselves that allow other people to understand that we are giving them trust in us. You know, we become vulnerable. We talk about good and bad. We are open enough to discuss the things that, might be seen as being showing our cards yeah i'm willing to show you some of my cards which encourages other people that over time becomes more like-minded to show us a little bit of the cards that they've got and then we do that back and forth really pressurized or crisis situations psychologically generate this a lot quicker don't they if you have got shared experience of massive highs or massive lows how quickly do you make a connection with people that have gone through similar things you talk about it, you get to the difficult stuff early and your trust goes fast and then you can build that relationship really quickly. So when you are talking about employees or team members or customers, you've got to think about how you are building that two way street, which requires disclosure as well as questioning. Barry would be would have low trust of me if I only asked about him, even if my intent came from a good place. Because it would be one sided. 
and he would start to wonder why. Why does he need to know this? What's where's he going? Get a bit skeptical. He hasn't said anything about himself. So how do you make that more two way with clients, with employees, with yourself? Being honest about what you want, and what you need. You know, if we think about how that then is affected by the differences, right? So the simple part is sharing. That's the simple part. The simple part is asking the question and creating the culture that allows you to talk about motivation openly and in a topical manner. You know, it can't be something you talk about once and then expect people to open up at, at a given day. We're going to talk about this in a week, right? You know, you can't manufacture that. It has to be interweaved into everything that you do. So you have to make it something that has a cadence to it, like a sales process. I'm not saying engineer it, but make it organic and make it something that people expect. Don't raise it once and expect to get all the answers. So if you think about how your priorities differ. Now, if I'm in a room doing this, one of the things I like to do is use those fantastic things called post-it notes. Different colored ones, we all fill them in. We've got priorities, we place them on the wall. What can we do with post-it notes? We can swap them around easily enough. If I asked you instead of to write three, which I've done because we're in a condensed session, if I asked you to write all the things that motivate you, that you want as outcomes, and put them on separate pieces of paper, and then I asked you to go and look at somebody else's, and then reprioritize them in your own order, it's likely they'd be quite different. There might be some areas of overlap, and that's why it's infinitely complex, isn't it? Because Barry, I, I, I don't know you personally, but I would guess that if you wrote your list out, a lot of your list would be on my list. It would be unlikely to be in the same order. There might be some, some crossover. So that's the complex side. The complexity is the individual. The simple, the simple part of the equation is firstly understanding that there is an equation and then caring about everybody else's. So let's just delve back into what John Stacey Adams said, right? He said our priorities differ. We relist them and we think about them. Our, our, our orders are different to other people. They're very different than customers. What's your priority? It's to sell my stuff, it's to make my business. Profitable, hopefully, at least sustainable. It's it's to offer the service. It's to, it's to do all the things that you've said. But actually, your initial priority could be quite different than theirs. Hopefully, even today's session makes you think more about uncovering and unearthing what that priority is for them. So when you do needs discovery, which is that term, isn't it, for getting to know and understand all the, the opportunities and the pain points and the things that you could leverage to help them genuinely is how do you get to the bottom of their motivations because if we if we now think about what happens when you are in a workplace let's take it back to being professional with our colleagues yeah if that is balanced how do you feel so you've got that equity you've got roughly equals to how do you feel phil how do you feel in fsb when you feel like there's balance between those two things after all, mute, yeah. Motivated. Yeah. So at, at worst, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. Satisfied, yeah. Um, I've articulated here that just with this little smiley face. I might even be over the moon, but I am I'm willing, yeah. And I'll roll my sleeves up. I'll get involved. I will do. I feel like I'm being rewarded fairly and reasonably for my efforts. And I am relatively happy and satisfied. Make sense? So, James, uh, where's James gone? Is James still on? I'm still here. Hi, James. <laughs> I can't see you. Oh, yes, yes, I can now. Um, so, if we go back to your refresher, right? If somebody is feeling okay about stuff, it's probably likely in the organization that you're doing a reasonable job at keeping them satisfied. Now, the problem with this is usually we don't notice until it's out of balance because there's nothing to notice. There's nothing really to notice. Your, your expectation is that you get a reasonable level of effort, input, 
motivation, satisfaction back from employees, right? Or people in the organization. So we don't really notice. It's kind of like the premise with customer service. We don't really notice, or the customer doesn't notice until we drop the ball. As soon as we drop the ball, it's obvious, yeah? So if you think about, right, what happens if that gets kicked out of whack or out of kilter, let's change just a simple thing. Let's change the sign in the middle to this. So now we've got, I mean, what's the position now? So Teresa, you talked about it being roughly equal to, what's the position now? Well, the input's greater than the outputs. And I suspect that you, if you feel that you're putting in a lot more than you're getting out of something, whether it's a relationship or the business or your employees or whatever, or if you're an employee and you don't feel you're getting much out of your employer, you're going to feel yeah. demotivated, aren't you? Yeah, the consequences are really quite immediate, actually, aren't they? That, you know, if you think about, I'm sure there's been times in your career, and it could be now, I don't know, you know, it, there are times when you feel like this. Who's felt like this? I'm giving more than I'm getting, like Teresa says, it has consequences. The cascade, it kicks in. You know, ultimately, your belief is that you're giving more than you're getting, and, and usually that leads to certain things. That, let's just discuss just for a moment the types of reaction in terms of the way that it manifests itself. Like, what are the consequences of that negative imbalance? So actually, we're kind of talking more about demotivation here, aren't we? But what 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 happens when somebody gets into this state of mind? What happens? They disengage. Yeah. They disengage. I read a quote the other day from that we've all probably seen lots, but it was just flashed up again. And it was, you know, the time to be concerned is when your most passionate employees go quiet. You're disengaged, right? Or nah, passive. You know, they were active before, they've gone passive. Um, and I get we're not all in an organizational sense. I get that we are some of us just running the show and running things, but. We have partners that help us deliver stuff. So it's not about line of reporting here. It's about influence, isn't it? And it's about relationships. So yeah, they can get disengaged. They can become completely disengaged while still physically being present. Still coming in, still trying to do a job, not doing it as well as you want, disengaged. Um, what other ways does it manifest itself? Can lead to um, can lead to burnout. If you've got a conscientious employee or team, then they'll continue to give, and I've seen this happen where they can give too much of themselves. So rather than go quiet, they could actually just, <laughs> could be significantly worse in terms of impact. Yeah, and, and often what you'll get is people trying to get more outcomes by doing more. Right. Yeah. If somebody is assertive and professionally capable enough and has the courage and bravery to have a conversation with who can affect their outcomes, they'll go and do it. But sometimes that person's hands are tied. So if it was me, for example, working, if I was your first employee or your hundredth employee and I came to you and you couldn't do anything about what I wanted you to do for me, your hands are tied. And now immediately I go away and I feel a certain way about that. And I do things that are a cascade in relation to input, whether it's up or down, whether it's lack of quality, whether it's, here's an interesting one. I, I heard a chap speak, I've done quite a lot of work at University College London, and I've interacted with quite a lot of the academics on a research side of you, on a research side around leadership. One of the guys, a guy called, you may have seen him, he writes in the broadsheet sometimes, called Professor Adrian Furnham, and he's a psychologist. He was talking about equity theory some time ago, and I was really interested because I talk about it. And one of the things he said, he wrote about it in a book he wrote, was there was some research done on Oxford Street about the top 20 flagship stores and how much stock went missing over the period of a year. And not all of that was customers coming in and taking stuff. Some of that was disgruntled employees who felt undervalued having their moral code of ethics eroded by the fact they didn't believe they were getting back enough and now started to do things that they wouldn't otherwise normally do. Now, I'm not saying that you steal either from your own business or somebody else's. And, and, and I mean, you know, for some of us, I mean, how many post-it notes that I bought could I actually take? 
you know, it wouldn't make any sense. But if you think about this in terms of teams, what tends to happen is people do steal. But actually what they steal is an intangible we can never get back. What do they steal? Phil, what do they steal? Time. They steal it... time. They steal time by all, all manner of methods. They're not as productive or they're not as, you know, or, or, or they don't give us as much or they try and give us more and their quality drops. So we end up having to increase resource time behind fixing problems or they start doing a lot of stuff that they should do on their own time in your time. And you can never get that back, right? We all know what that feels like. So there are many, many, many consequences to having this out of balance. And therefore, to come back to you, James, about the refresh, is if it's other people within your network or sphere of influence or in your business, is how can you get onto that quickly, have conversations that allow you to understand where it's going wrong and how there might, may or may not be a remedy. Yeah. So, you know, there's actions to that. Now, here, here's where it gets another layer of complexity to it. So I say it's simple, but I also have that caveat. It's, it's also complex. The complexity also comes in because of the fact that we're humans, we have a massive draw to go to social comparisons, don't we? We immediately look at others, yeah, and we draw comparisons about whether we're better off or we're worth, worse off in relation to our equation than other people. And I don't just mean money. There's lots of debate on LinkedIn about whether salaries should be um, transparent, whether people should talk about salaries. And part of it, in my mind, links into this, right? So if you've got a load of people stood around looking at their own equations and looking at other people, you know, they're now going to have a very subjective rather than objective view of whether somebody else is on a better, having a better ride than they are, including us. You can look at your competitors and think, I've been trying for five years to get this to this level of revenue. And this person's come in in two years and is smashing us. What's going on? And now all of a sudden you can feel like it's unfair. Yeah. You can do that very easily with, with, with colleagues in any organization. You know, because if you think about it, if you're being unfairly treated in comparison to your colleagues, this is even worse now. It compounds and I kind of double or treble up on, on, on that unhappy face. Yeah. So it gets exacerbated. I mean, anybody who follows sport may have been kind of flabbergasted in the past when rich sports people complain about their recompense per week, particularly football. You know, you see splashed across a headline. So and so complains of being on one hundred and twenty thousand pounds a week. Now, look, I have not got access to your accounts. I would guess most of us on here would take 120 grand a week. Yeah. With 120 grand a week, and it's not all about money, you can probably do whatever you want, live whatever you want, uh, enjoy your life in any way, right? But why is that? Now let's put that under the microscope. Why is that individual complaining about 120, if they are indeed complaining? Why are they complaining through these lenses? It's the relative, isn't it? It's the relative, so it's not absolute, it's not, and it's not always money. It could be so-and-so is getting more opportunity than me. Alison got to go on a course last week. I'd love to have gone on that course. Barry got a chance to, um, you know, go to London on the train and spend some time with the clients. That could have been the exact thing I was looking to do. But Anne never knew, because Anne didn't know that what I wanted to do was go and start to interact more with clients, and particularly that client, because, you know, and that's why it's complex, because actually now what you've got is all of that going on. And if that individual are £120,000 a week, and who, who are we to judge, right? If they were sat next to somebody in a changing room in a sporting environment, and they felt they gave more or had better outputs or worked harder in training, you know, the analogy follows through. But they were only on hundred grand they're probably starting to question whether they're getting valued properly by their employer. And the same goes for all of us, you know, who were on 20 pound a week. You know, it doesn't, it's not, it's not the absolute, it's the relative. So think about what the consequences are for that, not just employees, people that you influence, clients. Customers have motivations just as much as we do. We just got to try and work out what they are. So if you think about that, what you're looking for is balance. And here's another way of representing this. 
So Adam's equity theory is about trying to get that balance and maintain that balance as much as you can, which is complicated, but also simple. It's complicated because of the people, right? And from a client's point of view, it's about building trust. So if we take, for example, that whole premise of we shouldn't be in a rush. So I just go back to that, right? We shouldn't be in a rush because cadence wise with customers, you're hopefully going to, most of you have customers for quite a long time. Some of you may have just transactional businesses where it's one-off, but I think most of us, would it be a fair assumption to say that we're trying to generate lifetime value? Repeat, relationship, referral. So when we do that, you think about the premise of building that trust, right? At some point below that line at the bottom of the pyramid, we, don't, we haven't got trust, it's a new customer, or, or we haven't got trust for whatever reason. We're trying to get, relevance in their mind they trust competence don't they they don't just now and this is something that i hear a lot of people say and i also hear it refuted i actually refute it i don't think people just buy from people they like i think if they like them it's a bonus i think they buy from people they trust and for me that relates to competence around product service and capability and terry back to your point about relative expertise if you can advise me the trust grows but I won't let you advise me until I trust you. So it's kind of a vicious circle. You know, why should I be advised by Terry if I don't trust his competence yet? So it's, we'll do, we're trying to do that all the time. We're trying to build it. I mean, say, same with me on this today. Most of you had never met me. You didn't know whether I would end up being helpful or not. You didn't know whether I may or may not know what I'm talking about. And many of us are skeptical about that. Hopefully, I've showed you today that I can be of some use, hopefully, right? But the most important thing here is how do you get to the top of that pyramid? Because look at the gems that get shared at the top of the pyramid. Trust with personal information. Some people go too personal too quickly and push people away. Some people never get personal, which doesn't strengthen the relationship. So there's a balance and you've got to get it right based on the type of individual. But look at that trust with sensitive or financial information. You couldn't expect that unless you reciprocate. So that's what we're looking for is that building of trust, a willingness to commit to that ongoing relationship. So the stuff to the right-hand side of that line after the, the sale or the first date. Now, if we pull that back and then we say, right, what does that therefore mean? Well, unsurprisingly, I've got some, uh, some ideas to put your way in terms of your action plan after today. You'll have hopefully come up with a few things that you, you think you can implement, right? But if you start with yourself, I think it's a good place. So Terry, you said selfishly this, right? I think it's a great place to start. Put yourself under the microscope and be clear after today about what your own inputs and outcomes are and what you want to be satisfied to keep you in balance. Because if you're a business owner, if you're, not in, if you're not balanced, it's going to be hard to help other people be balanced, isn't it? It's the whole premise of putting the oxygen mask on first before you do your kids, isn't it? In terms of like, you know, I couldn't, if I can't breathe, I can't help you. So get yourself in order, right, first of all. Once you've done that, think about within your teams or within your wider set of key partners and partnerships, is that if there are suspected imbalances, Going and having appropriate conversations in a professional manner that allows you to fully understand what the root cause of that is. And together exploring ways that can make that environment or place better. We come back to normal, you know, my last word in that sentence is attitude. Attitude will affect it all. So think about how you try and get people back on an even keel. The other aspect about this is going out and really trying to understand other people's equations and priorities. I've given you hopefully a slightly different lens or slightly different vocabulary around leadership through sharing equity theory and the consequences of it to go and start to encourage you to have maybe subtly different types of conversations. From a customer perspective, imagine how powerful it would be in six months time if your relationships grew to the point where you were having open conversations about motivations that allows you to tailor your messaging around product or service in a slightly different way. You may be doing this really well already. I would challenge you to do it better. How do you do it better? Even by 5%? How do I do that better? 
And ultimately then, think about the style in which you do it. Do it genuinely. Disclose. Build trust. Take time. Keep it topical. Don't dive too quickly into expecting an answer. Disclose. Share. Make it a proper partnership. Think about the stuff to the right-hand side of the line. You know, deepen, deepen that relationship with customers. Get more opportunity. And when you come to speak, they listen more. Because, Terry, now you're the trusted expert, and I want to hear what your advice is. You win. I win. It's better. Yeah? Okay. Do you want me to leave those up for a moment? Phil, would it help if I shared the deck after today? What do you think, folks? Would it help if I share this deck with you? I, I'm sure it would. I'm sure Slides. people would be interested. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I'll, I'll happily do that. I'll PDF that. I'm, I'm conscious that some of you will have started at the start of the journey, which was this, right? So we did some sales DNA stuff. Um, I'm happy to have conversations externally with any of you that, that might want to dip into some of that at some point. Happy to do that. Conscious a couple of people of you were on that. This one, of course, has happened today. We've got um, two more sessions coming up in the new year. Not fixed dates specifically yet, Phil, are they? But we're going to look at negotiation specifically and helping you structure better outcomes. Um, I've, I've taught and helped with negotiation for about 15 years. Um, so I've got some depth of understanding about it, but more so it's the time in the trenches with people like you that help me understand this in detail. And I, of course, run, run a couple of businesses myself. So this is not just going to be about theory. This is going to be about the nuts and bolts. We're going to talk about tactics that people use. We're going to think about how to neutralize that. I'm going to give you a better structure potentially so you can kind of hang your skill set that you've got because you're seasoned campaigners around how to do it more effectively and identify when it went off track. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at change and managing things. Sorry for having the 15th in there. That was just a date that was, that was mooted in February, but I'm, I don't think we've agreed on that yet. So if anybody wants to hook up on LinkedIn, um, there are my contact details. If you've got any questions after today, feel free to ask me. But I, Phil, will guarantee that I will have this deck over to you in PDF form today. And then hopefully you can share it with, with all the people who, who've been here. So the other yeah, thing- I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat um, and anyone who wants it, please just email me directly. Can I just say yet again, Stu, that was fascinating and hugely informative and useful. And I really appreciate you doing this. And I'm really looking forward to the next couple too. So thank you so much. Um, right. Anybody uh, have any questions for Stu? Either just shout out or stick something in the chat. Yeah, um, any specific questions? We've got about five minutes. I'm happy to take anything, guys. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not claiming I'll have the answer, but I'll have a think about it. Um, anybody got any situations or things that they're thinking about as a consequence of this? Chance to ask you any questions pertaining to your own business? I think I think you must have done such a good job. You, you've had all your questions answered already. So I don't know whether Peter's got his hand up. Oh, Peter, Peter. Uh, is so that from earlier? Or? Probably a weird one. Um, so you're talking about balance and stuff like that and about how people feel sad when they're, or unhappy potentially when they're, feel like they're given more than everyone else yeah what do you do for weird people like myself who uh feel horrible if i've not got way more on the table than everyone else i like to be the person who's given a thousand times more than everyone's given yeah. back is there a well, way to counter that <laughs> yeah well I, I i i i deliberately left that out today the other or ch changing the um the side Sorry. the side i deliberately left it out a because of time but, but b because it's a complex one to deal with so okay. psychologically, for example, when somebody feels like they are getting... Now, let me ask you this, because if I change that sign around, what it actually says is I am getting more than I am giving. So let me just tease out, <laughs> do not mean that you're getting more than you're giving, do you? Do you mean you want to give more than you get? Yeah, a hundred times. I feel very uncomfortable okay. if I'm not... Um, yeah. Okay, so... I don't think there's anything up with that as a business owner. I think most of us relate to that, that we're willing to put in extra for not as much. Yeah, and I think that's fine. I think long-term, if you think about the cycle that that can generate for yourself, is that it can give yourself unrealistic expectations on what you can or should do for the business 
without getting some balance back. Now, don't forget that balance is not always money. You've got a list there as long as you're on. It could be that you're not giving yourself enough breaks or enough time to go and recharge or do the things that you know gives you joy apart from work. Yeah. So I would always say that when you've got that attitude, A, it's good as a business owner to have because your expectations are low about what you'll take initially back. But be mindful that that doesn't become a cycle that leads to burnout because it can. So don't, yeah. don't go down that route. So Peter, by all means, work really hard. I'm sure everybody here works really hard, right? Work hard, be selfless, be humble, have humility, have drive. Don't take too much initially, but think about getting the balance, right? So I would often say to people, don't take balance to be any one particular day or week because that's hard. Yeah. Let me give you an example, Peter. Monday to Wednesday this week, I worked 46 hours. I don't want a medal. It's just what happened. But this afternoon at two o'clock, I'm going to go. I'm going to do some stuff with my wife. I'm going to spend the evening with my kids. I'm going to switch off. Now, to me, that little, that few hours window, that break, it restores balance. It's not real balance but it restores balance. So I would say keep clawing back the things that get you back on an even keel. Um, and then hopefully eventually that translates into things like money and success and the things that you gauge as success, flexibility, time away, better clients, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, if you see that in other people, I think ego can become a bit of a part of that. So when you have individuals that are giving less and getting more, they can fill the gap with their ego. So some people think that they should be paid more or given more because they are better than others. And that therefore becomes a, a performance management challenge that business owners don't really enjoy. Hopefully you haven't got too many of those people, which is, I didn't want to dwell on it today, but if anybody's got that going on and wants to have a chat, I'm happy to do that separately. Um, there are ways that you can mitigate that and, 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 and reduce risk. But hopefully that gives you some ideas, Peter. Yeah, I did. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We've got one final question here, Mary. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Stuart. That was really, really um, informative and very, very helpful. Just one thing that came to my mind and I wanted to ask. So talking about motivation, something that I always kind of attach to motivation are values. Um, yeah. Yeah, so when I think about myself, the things that motivate me are the values that I hold. That plays a, a huge part in what motivates me. Um, I just wanted to find out what your thoughts were around values and, and the importance of that when we're talking about motivation. Yeah, I do. I think that's really important, Mary. And today, you know, there are many facets to it. And I think you've raised it as a, as a good point. I think what is really important to me about values, in a similar way that we've looked at today, is understanding yourself value-wise and what drives you. And then if you're going to grow, I think the cultural aspect of recruiting behind those values is really key because actually the values are what drives us, aren't they? You know, we will do things, we'll have motivation and energy behind the causes um, for that energy that we put into our work. So I think to have them aligned is absolutely critical. I would agree with you, Mary. Um, when I'm working with clients, that's another thing that I will go into because that's kind of sets it sets the tone, doesn't it? Um, I think it's really, really key. I think as you scale as an organization and as a business and you try and grow, that if you get that right, then you don't encounter a lot of the problems that other organizations encounter. So I think it's fundamental and it's a great point. Thank you. And with that, we'll bring the session to a close. Uh, thank you so much again, Stu. Such incredible insights and and extremely uh, well put i think you got over those often as you say quite complex ideas but you got them over so well um as you did previously so i'm really looking forward to the new to the two further sessions we've got in the new year please everyone do keep an eye on our events calendar for the dates of those sessions and for everything else uh, all the other events we've got going on across the organization um I thank you everyone for attending and I hope you all have a great Christmas. Before we go, can we all just uh, please give your indulgence to Stuart Maddox from Clamorton Training and Development, please. Fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks for giving me the time. And uh, I hope you have a, a great weekend when it comes and a successful week next week.